scriptures say that. Everybody says it's the truth. But we never accept it. The mind doesn't accept it. So you imagine an emptiness where there is abundance. You create a famine where there is abundance. And then you rush out into the world begging <coughs> for things, objects of the world, begging for emotions of the world, begging for knowledge from the world, when you have it all. You know, if you really did not have money, and you went begging, it's understandable. But for a billionaire to go out into the world begging is absurd. And every time you go out into the world begging, and I'm using this word because I'd like you to think about what you're doing, and then you yourself will understand that they are all beggars. You go out into the world for fulfillment, begging for things from the world. When you already have enough, so that's the starting point. When you don't know that you are full, you become a fool. So you have to replace the two O's with a U, that's all, in life. Thereafter, the mind strangles. So what does the mind do is what you need to understand. It projects a deficiency. It projects a lack. It imagines enemies outside. You believe one person is cheating. You know the worst part is that you don't trust the most trustworthy people in the world. And you fall prey to cheats. This is the history or the biography of every human being. Portrayed in Shakespeare's play, King Lear, he immortalized this. King Lear had three daughters, as you all know. I hope you know. <laughs> no, you know why I'm saying? Because in Western countries, they've stopped teaching Shakespeare for a tragedy. So anyway, three daughters. The first two daughters were after his money. The youngest daughter was the one he truly loved as a father, not as a king. And so on his 80th birthday, watch this movie, I think it's a movie or play where, um, what's the name of the actor? Fabulous. On his 80th birthday, he played the role of King Lear. It will come back, I mean, I'm getting old. <laughs> this, um, on his 80th birthday, he wanted to retire, so he drew a huge map of England and divided it into three and said, each of you, Three daughters will get one third of my territory. And then he asked the daughters, but before you actually get territory, I want to know what you think of me. This is the weakness. He's a king. And he asked his daughters, what do you think of me? Which means he wants his daughters to flatter. The first two daughters go into poetry, praising him to the skies, and he's pleased as punch. The youngest daughter sees this Tamasha going on. She's living. She's mad with her sisters. And mad with the father falling for it. And so when the father turns to her and says, And now, my dear, what have you to say? She says, Nothing. And he flies into a rage and says, Nothing. Nothing comes from nothing. So he doesn't give her anything. And the rest of the story is the tragedy where the two older daughters just torture him, take away everything. And in the end, it's the youngest daughter who comes back and serves him. This is what your mind does. So, now what happens is, because of this lack of self-sufficiency within, you project it outside. And you pick on the weakest person outside and say, this is the person who is, because of whom I am. So in the Indian context, it's usually the mother-in-law, weakest. Then, if you are proved wrong or you get caught, and you are forced to concede that you've been wrong, you very conveniently shift to somebody else. It's not the mother-in-law, it's the boss. It's not the boss, it's the maid. It's not the maid, it's something else. But it never occurs to you that it might be just you. And you're 
wrong understanding of this. It's like when a movie is projected on a screen, <coughs> suddenly you see a black spot on the cheek of the actor. And you say, what's wrong with him? And then suddenly the, the same black spot appears somewhere else, and somewhere else, and somewhere else. And you believe it's out there. The truth is, there is just a speck of dust on the lens of the projector. As long as your attention is on the screen, you can change the film, you can change the screen, you can watch the screen, you can change the auditorium, you can do what you like out there. It will not go until you just have to take a tissue and wipe the lens. Imagine, very little effort and it goes from there. Similarly, look within. The storm is within, the strength is within. So, you create an illusory world and then you suffer from that world. It's like you create a Frankenstein and that Frankenstein consumes you. It's your creation. So you have to call the bluff of your own mind. You have to question yourself. You have to ask or suspect that maybe what I'm thinking is not right. Maybe what I'm suspecting is not true. And invest all your energies in developing the strength within. So what is this strength? Where does this strength lie? The strength lies in your intellect, the buddhi. We are human beings. We are sovereigns of this world because of the intellect. Whether it is a scientist who is discovering things outside or the inner scientist who is discovering the world within, it is the intellect that is of importance. Why is the intellect important for us? Why is it that only the human being is endowed with the intellect? Because only the human being has what we call choice of action. To be vegetarian or non-vegetarian is a choice only you have. No lion can say, I'm bored of meat, let me switch to grass eating. Option not available. No tiger can say, I don't like this vicious life, let me be timid like a deer. Not available. But you and I have this choice of being noble, good, or vicious, and criminal. And since we have this choice, moment to moment we are exercising this choice. We are gifted with an intellect with which to make the right choice. Now, unfortunately, whoever created us made a mistake. He gave us the choice, and he gave us the intellect, assuming that we will, number one, use the intellect, number two, strengthen the intellect. But he didn't bargain for the fact that a human being is basically a lazy animal. Since you need to put in effort to use the intellect and develop it, we don't do it. So therefore, we end up making choices with a poorly developed intellect and that is the root cause of all our problems. <coughs> Think of one wrong choice you've made in life. Often people say, I should not have married this guy. <laughs> what? How did you make it? Why did you make it? Intellect not at all. <coughs> Think of one right choice you made. How did you make it? Intellect was good. So this intellect is of importance. The intellect is what guides you. You know, and the other thing that happens is that whoever created the world has made it difficult for us, has made our choices difficult because we, before explaining, I'll give you an example. Suppose you're invited to your nieces or, or whatever, two-year-old birthday party and you go there and you tell the little child, happy birthday, I've got a present for you, a gift, but you have to choose. And in one hand, you have a box of chocolates, the best chocolates in the world, 
beautifully gift wrapped, the child can see the chocolate. And on the other hand, you have a plain white envelope with a check for one million US dollars. You got that? Not rupees, US dollars. What do you think the child will do? Now what happens is, the mother stands behind the child and desperately says, the child looks at the mother, she understands what the mother says. The child looks at the check, not interested, grabs the child. I don't have to tell you what you would, I don't have to ask you what you would think if you were given the child. But what you have to understand is, what is the difference between the child and you? Why does the child take the child? Why does the child choose the chocolate? Instant gratification. Immediate gratification. Love for the chocolate. You love chocolates as much as the child does. Why did you make the child? Because you know what you can do with it? Knowledge. The child does not know the value of the check. You know. So therefore, however much you love the chocolate, you don't even look at it. You grab the check. This is a problem with us. See? We opt for the catchy these things. Stuff. Physical pleasures is something that you can understand. So you grab. You don't understand sacred joy. And I'm not even speaking of spiritual. Unfortunately, today children are not exposed to anything. When we were kids, we had the joy of reading books and fantasizing, being with ourselves in the world of thoughts. And so we at least experience that. Today it's not there. Today's kids are not exposed to higher joy. So therefore, and not forget that, just us. Because we don't know the knowledge of higher things, we don't know the joy content of intellectual delights, emotional joy, spiritual. We are constantly choosing material and physical things. We have become a generation of body worshippers. And in India, it's all about food. Hmm? That's why there's so many TV channels on food. Yeah? You read the newspapers, they're full of food. Why? Because it caters to your obsession. You don't look at anything beyond. You know, even when people go to an ashram, ashram means spiritual content. They come back and say, so if you were to ask them, how was it? Food was delicious. So therefore, expose yourself to higher things. Knowledge is of the essence. In ancient India, every child was exposed to spiritual knowledge. It was an integral part of the, of the education. Today, in the name of secularism, it's not there at all. So it's not taught in schools because it's not politically correct. It's not taught in universities. In corporate life, it is considered a bad name to talk about spirituality. And parents don't know. So where does the child pick up that? Are we turning out a generation of monsters with no values? What is it? And how will they be able to face the challenges of life? The storms of life cannot be Met with unless you develop the strength. Intellectual strength, which means question, think, inquire. Thinking has become the rarest commodity today. You don't think, you don't question. Why do you wear the clothes you wear? Because someone decided that you should wear these clothes. Because it's in fashion. No one thinks, does it suit me? Am I fit for it? Is my life 
mission in line with the clothes that I wear? No, they hurt it. Everybody does. <laughs> no one questions how should I be living in life? How much of my time should I invest in different things of my life? You do it because someone else decides. Her instinct. The person who thinks stands out as an exceptional person. So that intellect needs uh, nutrition. And that nutrition is Vedantic knowledge. Get it. You know, in this country, we have shortages of all kinds except spiritual literature. Grab it wherever you can. And that spiritual literature must blend with or match your personality. In, in other words, if you are an intellectual person, you need intellectual knowledge. If you are a devotional person, you need more of bhakti, uh, devotion. If you are an active person, you need to work in a spirit of service and sacrifice. So there must be a match between the spiritual cause that you espouse and your nature. And then there must be sincerity. If you are not sincere to yourself, how will you improve? Self-improvement is not to show off. Self-improvement is to gain the satisfaction, immense satisfaction. Yes, I am a better person than I was two years ago, five years ago, than when I was born. We are all born as caterpillars, dependent. Like a caterpillar feeds off a leaf all, it, all its life. But the caterpillar is not born to die as a caterpillar. It's born to transform into a butterfly and take to its wings and soar up in the sky. Similarly, friends, you and I are born mortal. But we are not designed to die mortal. We are born to take off into the subtler realms of the spirit. And then you become independent of the world. Then you will be able to weather the storm. Fly. The fundamental truth is all of us are a mix of spirit and matter. We all have matter, body, mind, intellect. But we also have the spirit component which gives life to the otherwise insentient materials. World consists of matter. One half of you consists of matter. One part, not half. So the matter in the world will necessarily affect the matter within. Take for instance, take a horseshoe magnet and take a piece of iron to the magnet. What will happen? It attracts, it influences, it affects the iron piece. However powerful the magnet may be, take a piece of wood to the magnet. The magnet doesn't have the power to influence the wood. Now there's something interesting. Tie the iron and wooden pieces together and bring the combination to the magnet. What happens? What happens? It's affected. But even when the combination is affected by the magnet, the wooden piece in that combination is immaculate untouched, unaffected. Similarly, friends, you and I are like this combination of spirit and matter. The world is a powerful magnet which influences the matter in you. The heat outside will influence your body but not the real you, not the spirit. The world doesn't have the power to influence the spirit in you. But because you have tied yourself to matter, you have bound yourself to matter, and identified with matter. When the world affects the matter in you, you seem to be affected. So you don't need to deal with the world. Leave the world as it is. Just disassociate yourself from matter. Disentangle yourself from matter. And then you will be in an oasis of peace and happiness in the 